Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Gabriel, the program coordinator for the Lewisboro Library. Tonight's program is Disability in Ancient Egypt, presented by Dr. Alexandra Morris. Dr. Morris, who grew up in South Salem, is currently an associate lecturer in Heritage and the Humanities at the University of Lincoln in the UK. So we really appreciate her accommodating our 7 p.m. start time being added as it is now early tomorrow morning for her. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. To get started, I want to basically talk about how I came into this field in the first place. Um, I'll be discussing what we know about disability and bodily difference in ancient Egypt. And I also wanted to share some baseline information to make sure we're all on the same page. And I also just want to, at this point, issue a content warning that there will be human remains visible and discussed in this presentation. So I got started. I grew up wanting to be an Egyptologist, and I got all the way up to my grad program before I experienced blatant ableism. I have several palsy and that was kind of the first time in my life where it became a problem and it just so happened that at the museum this is about the Penn Museum in Philadelphia they had a mummy or a disabled man who was disabled in their museum and this man is from the fifth dynasty BCE and he was buried with his cane and he had one leg that was about six inches shorter than the other. And this is an interesting example of disability in ancient Egypt because it shows that there was societal care for disabled people even back then. So because of what was going on with me in my grad program and this kind of meshed and I said, wait a minute, no one else has been researching this. So this kind of is what got me started researching disability in ancient Egypt. And I've gone on and got my doctorate in this. Disability in ancient Egypt and in the ancient world is not what most people think it is, because most people, when they think of disability in the ancient world, think of automatically Sparta and infanticide of disabled infants. I will show throughout the course of this presentation that the reality is a lot more complicated and more nuanced than we were previously led to believe. So that's kind of how I got my start. So moving on, I want to go through some basic definitions to make sure we're all on the same page and some go through some theories that I understand as a scholar that I work with in my work. So when I mention a disability, I mean a physical, emotional, or mental difference that limits a person's movement, senses, or activities. When I talk about ableism, I mean prejudice and discrimination against those with disabilities as well was the favoring of non-disabled people over disabled people. And when I mentioned disabledism, I mentioned a set of assumptions, both conscious or unconscious, and practices that promote the differential and unequal treatment of people because of actual or presumed disability. And these last two concepts mainly come into play when we look at some of the scholarship that is written by other scholars. And we'll get to that in a minute. So to continue, um, two kind of theories that underpin my research and the research of other scholars who study this are the models of disability. Traditionally, what has been understood in Western society um, until about the 1970s is what is known as the medical model of disability. And this views disability as being the problem that is centered within the disabled person. So they therefore have to fix themselves to fit into society, as we can kind of see in this diagram. And this diagram also uses language that is often associated with this model. So a person needs help and carers. They are, quote unquote, confined to a wheelchair. They can't walk. They have to fix themselves to fit into society. The newer model that was developed by disability activists in the 1970s is what is known as the social model of disability. And this argues that the problem is not the disabled person, it is the fact that society itself is inaccessible. So the problem is that the world is disabling. In this model, um, a person's difference is what is known as an impairment. So that's an individual's physical, sensory, or cognitive difference. And disability is the name for the social consequence of having that impairment. 
So people with impairments are disabled by society. So disability is therefore a social construct that can be changed and removed. However, there are some problems with this model as well. Namely, with people like with my disability, which is cerebral palsy, you can give me as many societal accommodations as you want. You do not change the fact that my brain communicates differently with the rest of my body. So that's just, but those are kind of two main underpinnings that have been understood in Egyptology up to this point in relation to disability. So from here, we're going to go into what evidence do we actually have for disabled people in ancient Egypt. And I should say that my evidence primarily focuses on physical impairment or physical disability because that's what I found and that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, I should move on to the, this point. A certain note about language, as we'll see in the scholarship. Um, traditionally, scholarship having to do with disability has been very ableist. And part of what my research has been has been going through and trying to figure out what these um, artifacts and objects and human remains can actually tell us without while also having to weave through what this language is and these assumptions that these other scholars have brought to the table as Egyptologists. And I have two examples here. The top example here um, that Hephaestus just suffered from a congenital deformity that limited his movement is traditionally how this language has been used in the scholarship. The below example is Hephaestus just had a congenital mobility impairment or disability. This is a more neutral understanding. The first um, sentence is making assumptions that just because a person has a disability, they're suffering and that this disability limited him. So this is kind of what you also have to weave through as a disabled person, which can be upsetting. And the other thing that I also wanted to point out is that within the disabled community, there is a preference for identity first language, which is identity, uh, which is means disabled person versus person with a disability, with the exception of those in the um, intellectual disability community. And that's because of the history of the disability rights movements and how that has happened. So I just wanted to point that out. And this is also a link to a guide that I published and co-authored with Dr. Debbie Sneed to try and address this problem with language in the field. So that's what that link is at the bottom there. So I, now that I've talked about scholarship, this is the kind of language again that is seen in the scholarship. And I have two re more recent examples of this that is seen by other scholars. One is a Hellenistic example. So this is talking primarily about Greece. And the other one is a more recent example that's talking about Egypt. And these again, kind of shows kind of like these biases and these preconceived knowledge, uh, notions that other scholars who are non-disabled are bringing to kind of this field. So the one on the left is by Angela Shanitos, War in the Hellenistic World, A Social and Cultural History from 2005. And he writes, the greatest risk is war is death and battle. The greatest suffering is to survive, but be disabled. Although numbers of casualties are often given by Hellenistic historians, we get no information about their treatment or about their future life. There is no way to estimate the percentage of crippled soldiers who lived as a burden to their families. So there are a number of assumptions in that thing there. And as I will show tonight, these assumptions are not necessarily true. And just to highlight this, I have a picture of Philip II of Macedon, who was um, a king before, directly before Alexander the Great, who was disabled. He was missing an eye and had a broken collarbone and a broken leg. And these were all caused by war injuries. And he was still king up until the time of his death. So like this did not affect his position in society. So that kind of assumption that these soldiers were burdens to their families was also not necessarily true. And this is a more recent example here on the right in which the language has actually gotten worse. This is from 2022. This is from Toby Wilkinson, Tutankhamun's Trumpet, the, uh, the Story of Ancient Egypt and the Hundred Objects. Um, he writes, those who are lucky enough to survive such scour scourges might still be scarred for life. Deformity is not often depicted in Egyptian sculpture and painting, 
the purpose of art being to portray an ideal state of affairs, but skeletons and remains tell a different story. Several build the telltale signs of hernias and spinal tuberculosis, which left sufferers with hunched backs and twisted spines. In the pre-dynastic cemetery of Adama in Upper Egypt, two skeletons with the latter disease were uncovered, in each case accompanied by pottery representations of the deformity. These seem to be rare examples of sufferers celebrating their disability. In the similar vein, the stele of a doorman from the late 1890s she shows him with a wasted white leg and a deformed foot supporting himself on a long stick. And again, as we go through this presentation tonight, I will try and prove that what he is saying here is not true. Disability was commonly represented in Egyptian art. It was not rare. And it was an accepted part of life in ancient Egypt. So from here, we're going to go into our first set of disabilities that we have evidence for in ancient Egyptian art and textual evidence. And this is blindness and visual impairments. Um, on this slide, we have some of the different examples of this, and it, it appears in objects that you don't necessarily expect. On the left here, we have what are known as eyes of Horus or Ujots or Wajits, depending upon what you like to call them. In the myth of Horus, Horus was one of the main gods of ancient Egypt, and he was king of ancient e Egypt. And his father, was Osiris, was originally king of ancient Egypt as well. And the myth goes that his uncle Seth, his evil uncle Seth, um, killed his father Osiris and took over the throne. And when Horus came of age, he fought um, Seth for control of Egypt. And in that process, one of his eyes was torn out, or depending upon which version of the myth you believe, both of his eyes were torn out and he became blind. And he did eventually succeed and become king of ancient Egypt, and then thereafter protected all the pharaohs who came after him. But these amulets, or ujots, are representative of this blind eye, and they were used by the ancient Egyptians as protective or apotropaic amulets. So amulets that were used to protect them from harm, um, both spiritually and medicinally. So that's one example of blindness we have in ancient Egypt. So this ranged basically from their gods to, as we'll see, more everyday people. Our next example up here on the top left is also related to Horus. This is what is known as an Egyptian mongoose. And the Egyptian mongoose, or ichnomen, as they're also known, um, is also believed to have been blind or representative of a blind god or Horus when he, he was in the state of being blind. So this is a mongoose mummy, which again is representative of blindness. We also have here in the center, a baboon, again, holding a wadget or that blind eye of Horus. It is again being used religiously and socially as a protective amulet. Up here in the top left, we have a textual evidence, which tells us more a bit about everyday people and not so much the mythological. What this is, this is from the Brooklyn Museum, is a prayer to the god Amun to basically heal someone who has gone blind. Um, to basically what the translation is, my eyes no longer tell me which way to go, I can't see, please heal me. So this shows that there was also kind of a mixed um, understanding of blindness in ancient Egypt, where congenital blindness, as we'll see, was more accepted, so blindness that you were born with, um, blindness that was acquired through work injuries, there was an expectation that the gods would be able to heal you, and an expectation that it was natural for you to want to be healed in ancient Egypt. Now, congenital blindness is representative of here in this bottom left, or bottom center image, rather. This is a blind harpist, and this dates from the Ptolemaic period, so this is later on in Egyptian history. This is from the time period that dates from roughly the time of Alexander the Great's death to the death of Cleopatra VII. 
And we also have earlier representations, as we'll see, of blind harpists in ancient Egyptian society in paintings. And this is interesting because it shows people, there's some argument over whether they were born congenitally blind or whether this was symbolic, but as we'll see, it seems to have been um, an actual disability rather than symbolic blindness. Um, but they were basically being employed in jobs and trained in jobs that they could do given their impairment. And that's the important point to take away from that. Um, down here, all over right, we have, this is from the Roman period. We have a young man who appears to have had some form of eye surgery and something going on with his eye here. This is a Fayum mummy portrait. So these portraits are very, very lifelike and were probably actual representations of what these people actually looked like. Um, but we say that he had something going on with his eye here because this one eye is missing all of its eyelids and he has a surgical scar under his eye. Um, it has been theorized by other scholars, mainly Karev, Ella Karev, that this may have been to treat a cataract or something along those lines that would have impacted his vision. But he's also interesting because this one side of his face, the muscle musculature is also very slack. So he may have had something else going on there as well. Physically, we don't know. Um, moving on to other examples of wine harvest, as I said, we would have the states from the 19th dynasty. So this is from roughly the time period directly after Pharaoh Tutankhamun ruled. And we again have a blind harpist. And as I said, there are some Egyptologists who argue that these portrayals of blind harpists in the ancient Egyptian and blind musicians in the ancient Egyptian artwork is meant to be symbolic. However, this is from the tune of Nabamun. Uh, this is a particularly interesting example because if they were meant to be symbolic, we also have sighted musicians in this example. So that doesn't exactly make sense because then if it was meant to be symbolic, you would think that all of them would be shown as blind, but they're not. So again, this is also just an example of someone with an impairment in society who is being trained in a job that they can do and being employed in that society. So I think that that's an interesting example and he is being playing with everyone else. So he is not segregated in any way. So this kind of goes against that whole thing that I also shared with you earlier about disability representation being rare in ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptian artwork. Moving on to our next set of disabilities, which is what are known as mobility impairments. Um, there are a lot, and the most famous example we have in ancient Egypt of someone with a mobility impairment or a physical disability is actually the pharaoh Tutankhamun. And Tutankhamun is also a great example of this bias that we see in the scholarship around disability. Tutankhamun at this point in time is now believed to have been born with club foot, had a cleft palate and scoliosis as well. And we think he was, um, he used a cane to get around. He was buried in his tomb with over 131 walking sticks. Um, there are, again, however, some scholars who argue that all of those walking sticks, even though some of them have shown evidence of being used, and one of them was described in an inscription as being his favorite, are representations of his power and don't actually mean anything or have anything to do with his mobility and cannot seem to grasp the concept that something can be used as a mobility aid and can also be a status symbol. It can be both. So there's very binary thinking going on there. Um, this example, I also like to point out how he's been portrayed in the media is again representation of this bias. The representation of him with his disability, as you can see here, 
is very unflattering and it's very disrespectful to him as a king. This portrayal has him with his cane, he's standing in his underwear, and he has almost a grotesque look to him. Whereas if you compare him again to Philip II, who was king of Macedon, who I shared with you earlier, who also was disabled by war wounds, in his case, these portrayals are much more respectful. And the only difference between the two of them, honestly, is that Philip II was war wounded or had acquired disabilities and Tutankhamun was born with his. But it again kind of shows that bias. And the other feature that I like to point out in his tomb, um, because we could, I could do a whole other separate lecture that's just on his tomb and how they accommodated his disabilities. But another example of this within his tomb that kind of is respective of how they accommodated his disabilities, but also reveals kind of this underlying scholarly bias is his chairs. All of his chairs that were found in his tomb when Carter found him originally had these linen straps on the top of, of the chairs, which you can see here on two of them. The two leading theories out at this time that are not mine are that either that these straps acted as a do not sit sign to tell people not to sit in his chairs or that they were used as carrying straps for the chairs which if you look at them does neither theory really makes sense a he was king he was the most powerful man in egypt he did not need people to tell signs to tell people not to sit in his chairs i mean that's just ridiculous the other theory um, doesn't really make sense because we have paintings showing them carrying the chairs and they're carrying the chairs by the bottom of the chair, not the top. My theory that I put out and published on and has kind of been somewhat accepted in scholarship is that these were actually perhaps seat belts or harnesses to help him keep him upright in his chair given his disabilities. And this makes far more sense. Unfortunately, we don't have the linen straps survive because Carter disposed of them when he excavated the tomb because he felt that they were unimportant. So we don't know, but that's that piece of that. Um, moving on, as and this goes along with the theory on the canes and about them being a mobility aid rather than necessarily a status symbol, we again have our earlier friend from the 5th Dynasty BC, who was earlier than Tutankhamun, so Tutankhamun was dy Dynasty 18. Um, who again was buried with a cane that he was using as a mobility aid. So the precedent is there of them burying people with things they needed in their afterlife. And we also have a later example. This is the 19th century, the 19th dynasty um, example of Roma, who was a doorkeeper, where he is again shown using a cane with a mobility aid. And Roma, the current theories are that he either had polio or a more recent theory that has been put out by Aidan Dodson in the book that I am co-editing, which I'll talk to you more a little bit about later, is that Roma may have had cerebral palsy. And this theory actually makes sense because cerebral palsy can only, depending upon what kind you have, may only affect one limb of the body. And that is, seems to be what Roma has going on here. But Roma is another example of a disabled person being shown in ancient Egyptian art who is employed, who has a family, um, and his family appears to be non-disabled, and he is doing a job that he can do with his mobility aid. We know from the inscription on this that he was a doorkeeper who was empo employed by a rich lady named Yamia. And what this stele shows him doing is him worshiping the goddess Astarte with his wife and son. So there's that. Um, disability in ancient Egypt is so common in artistic depictions that it is literally everywhere. There is actually an example of a disabled man in this stele, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of the of art. This is from the 11th dynasty. So this is again between that time period of when the pyramids were built and when Tutankhamun came to power. 
And I'll give you a second to look at this and I'll show you where he is in here. He's on this bottom register. This is another man, which you can see if you compare him to the others, has musculature that is much skinnier than everyone else. And he is again using a cane as a mobility aid. We don't even know who this man is. This was this common. He is in this group of workers who are bringing offerings to Intef and his wife. So he's just an unnamed worker who is appearing in this. But he is again disabled and employed and doing a job that he could do given his disability. All right, the, moving on, this is more my own personal research that I did during my doctorate. And I again have since published on this, and it seems to have been expected. Um, accepted within the scholarly community at this point um, is on cerebral palsy. And again, this is the disability that I have. Uh, cerebral palsy is a disability that affects movement, balance, posture, coordination, and motor skills. It is often but not always caused by brain damage occurring um, before birth or during or shortly after birth, and is often associated with premature birth, but not always. It is one of the most common um, disabilities that you can be born with today, and it's the most common physical disability in childhood. And I, those are the numbers for the numbers of births today. I expect numbers to have been similar or higher in the ancient world, given the birth difficulties and the lack of medical care that they had back then. And I also just want to note that there are several different subtypes within the disability, which means that your muscles can be um, more uh, floppy looking, or they can be more rigid depending upon what type you have. So we do have other examples of cerebral palsy in ancient Egypt. Our first example is actually from the 13th dynasty. Um, this is a noble woman called Gehazet, who is here on the right. Uh, who was buried in a Dravel Naga cemetery in Western Thebes. Researchers think she may have had cerebral palsy because of the positioning of her arm. She again has that very rigid arm, which you can see there um, where her wrist is bent. And the embalmers, for whatever reason, did not try to correct this during the mummification process. And we also know this from marks, where marks left on her skull. Uh, which shows that she was chewing using one side of her mouth basically more than the other, and that she was sal salivating a lot as well. So part of having CP is that you can have excess saliva, so she appeared to have that. The other example of someone possible to use CP we have is the pharaoh Sipta, who ruled in the 19th dynasty, so the dynasty after Tutankhamun. We again think that, based on his mummy, um, we have, you can see the positioning of the foot there. So you again have that very rigid musculature. And if you think back to Roma, who we just looked at, that's very similar to the positioning of Roma's foot, which is why Dodson thinks Roma may have also had cerebral palsy. And we also have the positioning of his arms. Um, ancient Egyptian pharaohs were typically mummified with their arms in an X shape. But if we looked at Sipta, his arms are in an L shape. And they think that's because the musculature was so rigid that they could not fully flex his arms into that X shape position as caused by the CP. From the more Greek side of things, because the time period I specialize in is when the Greeks came in and um, basically conquered Egypt. We have um, Herodotus, the story of a noble woman named Labda whose legs were basically shaped like the leather, Greek leather lambda. So they were again flexed in an awkward position. And we also have mention of cerebral palsy in the fifth century BCE by the physician Hippocrates, where he's describing symptoms that seem to resemble a lot in infants. So my research has shown a couple of different examples of possible cerebral palsy. This is an artifact from the British Museum. This is from the Greco Roman period or Ptolemaic period, which is again the time period I study. This is an example of a child, we do, unfortunately don't know this child's gender, who is older, who is using a wheeled walking aid. And again, we think that this is possible cerebral palsy because if you look at the musculature in the legs, the musculature in one leg is 
more developed than the other, and that's commonly seen in those with CP. And if we look at the posture of this child, it has that crouch gait, which you can see a reference pose down here on the lower left. Uh, that is also commonly seen in those with CP, depending upon what type they have. And this is also a very, very interesting figure because this is a mold-made object, which means that there was a, a market for this kind of art for whatever reason, so this would have been mass-produced. And also why we don't necessarily know this child's gender is because it could have potentially been customized based on what the buyer wanted. Um, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks both specified gender by uh, what color they painted um, the fi their figures. Men were traditionally um, shown as having darker or redder looking skin and women were shown as having white, whiter skin. So potentially you could get this object and you could say, I want it to be a girl or I want it to be a boy and you can have it customized. So that may be why we don't know your gender as well. But this is again, an intriguing object. And I also argued in my doctoral research that disability might have been so commonly depicted during this period because you, of the policies of Alexander the Great, which basically were where he was granting um, land grants to disabled war veterans, which put them in power during this period politically, socially, and religiously. And it seems to be reflected in an increase in disability representation in the arts. So that basically they wanted art that represented them and their families. So moving on to more personal research from this, this this is, again, my research. So far, no one else has come up with this, even though it's there in the textual evidence. I have argued that the god Herpocrates, um, who was a Greek-Egyptian hybrid god, also seems to have had cerebral palsy. Who Herpocrates was, was he was the son of Isis, the heir of Osiris, and the son of Serapis. And he was basically another form of the god Horus, who, if you remember earlier, was the protector god of kings. Um, Harpocrates, more specifically, also had other features. He was also the god of secrets, confidentiality, silence, the embodiment of Pope, and representative of the newborn son. He's also an interesting god because he was also known as a protective deity. He more specifically protected mothers and children, and he was associated with the solar cult of Tosiris and the mortuary cult and cult of Serapis, and he's alternately known as Horus the Child. And what's interesting is he is described by the ancient historian Plutarch as, quote, prematurely delivered and weak in his lower limbs, which, if you remember, matches the symptoms of cerebral palsy. And if you look at the art, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks seem to be deliberately depicting him with these symptoms throughout. And he changes age and gender in his art, and it's the same throughout. So the first, this is, again, the pose. That way I talked about that's commonly seen in those with CP. This is known as a crouch gate. These are some of the amulets we have on him. And these, again, would have been protective amulets that people would have worn to protect them from harm. We have him where he's standing here. And we also have what have been traditionally described by other scholars where he's quote unquote sitting. But if you look at them, and the pose he's in, he doesn't appear to be sitting. He appears to, in fact, have this crouch gait that I had described earlier, where his hand is straight out in these two examples, but his knees are kind of bent and have that uneven musculature. And I do have an example where he is sitting, where his hand is flat out, where it's, it would have been resting on something, where in these examples, it's straight down. And again, he's been described by other scholars as sitting, and I do not think that is correct. I think he has that cerebral palsy crouch gait pose instead. So these are some examples, and this is consistent too across because he's also sometimes depicted as an infant. So again, this is the pose that you would commonly see in CP. This is an example of an infant with CP who would have decreased muscle tone. And if we look at him in the art where he's breastfeeding with his mother Isis, um, he is again 
leaning over to one side, seems to have decreased musculature, and his arm on this particular example seems to be very, very twisted. And he again has the floppy musculature in this example. These are more Egyptian looking examples. The ones on the top left here are more Greek looking examples. And again, we have the same thing, where again, he seems to be having trouble holding his hat up. He has kind of a knock kneed crouch gait pose where his legs are kind of flaring out like frog's legs. And it's the same thing, even though he's more Greek looking and he's clothed in that example, whereas in the ones, the Egyptian examples, he's nude. This continues in depictions of him as an older child. Again, this is the pose commonly seen in those with cerebral palsy. And these are depictions of him as an older infant, where he is again kind of floppy looking, not sitting up straight and has that kind of wide base sitting stance as well. Again, the reference pose, and again, the art, where he's again being shown with us. And I have also since expanded on this and pointed out that he is being shown with lotuses in very interesting um, locations. And lotuses were used by the ancient Egyptians as pain relief. And in those with CP, pain and musculature pain is a common problem. And it's very interesting because they are depicting him with lotuses on his head or he's sitting directly on them. And we know from what Plutarch described that would have been where the CP would have been affecting him. And lotuses did also have a double meeting in ancient Egyptian culture as being representative of the sun and the solar coat, solar cult as well, but they also like to play with meanings with things. So the fact this could have potentially had a double meaning would have been something that would have appealed to them. Um, again, these are more Greek looking examples. He again has the musculature that is uneven between his two legs. And he's again kind of leaning up on things and using things as a mobility aid as well. These are more Egyptian looking examples. And these he is standing, but he again is using papyrus canes. And these are interesting examples as well, because what these are are sipi, and they would have been used medicinally by the ancient Egyptians to help cure illnesses, um, namely either snake bites or scorpion swings. So it's again showing his protective role and he is also frequently shown with the god Bas, who is another disabled god in ancient Egypt, who is also, again, a protective deity. And Bas is believed to have dwarfism, so it's interesting that they pair together in, in these instances. And here he is again. Um, this is with the later Ptolemies. He's being shown here. Um, the goddess behind him is offering him a cane in this particular example. So that's just also interesting. Um, here he is again. He again has that wide base uh, sitting stance in these two examples. And what these are are statues of statues of the god. So we literally have priests carrying around statues of the god in this instance. And he again has that same pose and again has that lotus on his head. And again, he's being carried around by priests here. He again has that knock needs stance. And this is just another interesting example here. This is a priest on the left um, who is wearing a Harpocrates amulet. And what is, intrigued me about him, he's originally from the British Museum, is the positioning of his hands, which if you look at them, is very reminiscent of Gehazit, who is that noble woman who I discussed earlier. So this is an example of potentially of a disabled person being a priest in ancient Egypt of Harpocrates. Um, so that's just another interesting example. He also has a feminine form known as Harpocratus. And as we'll see here, again, the will be all stereo changes. The poses do not. You again have that crouch gait, the musculature on the one leg being bigger than the other. And again, that wide base sitting stance that's commonly seen in CP. And I have since expanded to other time periods to see if this held up besides just the Ptolemaic period as all those examples were that I just showed you. And it does appear to, and it also appears to transcend other mediums as well. So this is a um, mold here where again, you have that wide base sitting stance 
This is, again, another example from the Met, where three has traditionally been described as sitting, where if you look at that pose, that is not sitting, especially if you look at the arm positioning. This is a later Roman example, where you again have that weird kind of crouch gait. This is a bead, where you again have the same thing going on with the leg there. Again, Roman example. This example is interesting because he's seated on the lotus in this particular example. And other examples of him breastfeeding, where he's kind of listless and hanging over to one side. This particular um, tall make example is interesting because he's very crooked here. And this is him with another goddess, so this shows that this holds even when he's with other goddesses. This is the goddess Wajit of Lower Egypt in this example. And I have a mold here from the Brooklyn Museum where it shows that they were deliberately making him with this pose. And this is a later Roman example where he again has a kind of crooked back. Scoliosis is also commonly seen in those with cerebral palsy. I have it myself. Other examples, this is from the Chicago Museum where he's again being shown where he's supposedly seated, where he doesn't look like he's seated. He has a very crooked uh, finger in this example, and he's being supported in the middle here by two goddesses. So they're physically holding him up. This is from Durham, same thing. And this is another interesting example here where we have him again. He's seated on the lotus throne and he's surrounded by the god Bas, who, if you remember, has dwarfism. So you have this pairing of this two, these two disabled gods there. Again, and this is just to show you how small some of these are. So this was very deliberately made. This was not artistic mistakes. And I also have Caparanda of the, from the Brooklyn Museum, which are of other um, deities or pharaohs being representative at the infant's breastfeeding. And these infants are actively engaged in breastfeeding, whereas he is not. And or they're being shown as pharaohs and they're sitting up nice and straight, whereas he is not. So the ancient Egyptians were very capable of representing infants in a more naturalistic pose, but they are deliberately choosing not to with him. Again, more examples of infants actively breastfeeding. All right, so this kind of leads us into our next disability, which is dwarfism. And I know I've gone on for a while, so I'll keep going. Um, because I know we have an hour, so I'll try and wrap up. Um, we move on to our next set of, of gods, which is uh, Chaikos, who is another healing deity in ancient Egypt who was shown with dwarfism. And he's interesting because he also has that kind of pose that we saw that Harpocrates had in that healing sit-by. And Chaikos was also the god of craftsmen and also related was related by the ancient Greeks to their god, Hephaestus, who also was a god of craftsmen and was also considered to be disabled as well. Um, Hephaestus supposedly had club foot. So that's just another interesting comparison. Uh, these are more examples of Bess where he, I'm sorry, this is Bess moving on to Bess, who we saw earlier, who was also depicted in various forms and a feminine form as well and he had dwarfism. And this is just an interesting example here of the top left, where he was shown as a soldier, which goes back to that time period of Alexander the Great, where they're representing the gods in their own image. And this example here on the top right is feeding bottles that we think were used for um, infants who were having trouble breastfeeding or um, people who were ill and needed nourishment and were having trouble um, taking on regular sustenance. So they kind of accommodated for that as well. This is Sunep. This is what kind of the most famous example of a person with dwarfism in ancient Egypt. Um, he lived during the same time period as the building of the Great Pyramids in the Old Kingdom of Egypt. And he's an interesting example because his name in ancient Egyptian means healthy. We know that he was a well-known priest during this time period. And this is kind of a family portrait of him, which I love, which shows him with his wife, Sinaitis, who was a high-ranking priestess, and his two children. And the artist depicted him with dwarfism 
And as you can see, his wife and two kids were fully um, non-disabled. And the scenes in his tomb were also interesting because the ancient Egyptians had this thing that they called hierarchical proportion, which meant that the most important person had to be depicted as the biggest. And it presented an interesting challenge with Senna because of his dwarfism. So what the artist did was they got around this by showing him as having the proportions of dwarfism, but also still depicting him as the biggest person in each scene. But what this meant is that his wife could not be depicted in the scenes with him because she was obviously bigger than he was. So what they did is they got around this by depicting her in parallel scenes that were under the scenes that he is. So here he is meeting with three officials and here she is caring for the three kids in the scene. So they parallel each other, but they're both being shown as taking care of their family and, perfor and performing these roles that society would have expected them to within that society. So he is, again, a fully engaged member of that society as well. I have, I'm going to end briefly on two examples. One is a possible example of intellectual impairment. This is Philip III Aridaeus. He is Alexander the Great's older half-brother who became pharaoh after Alexander died. He is described in the ancient sources as having some kind of specified intellectual impairment. We don't know what he had, but it made him ineligible, supposedly, to become king. He, however, did rule for seven years after Alexander the Great died. And most of the scholars have written him off as being unimportant. But if we look at him and we look at the archaeological evidence, the ancient Egyptians at least seem to have been recognizing him officially as king. We have him being depicted here as pharaoh on a wall in Karnak. We have coins with him where he is has his name on them. We also have, this is a clip side, we have a water clock which shows him making offerings to the gods on behalf of Egypt. And we have a, a tomb chapel that's in Karnak, where he is said to have restored some of the other temples as well. So the ancient Egyptians are giving him, in this instance, the agency that uh, the scholars today are not, because as I said, they are writing him off for the most part as being an important, oh, he was the intellectually disabled brother of Alexander the Great. He didn't have any agency. And this is most commonly shown um, by a particular example where after the death of Alexander the Great, we have his Alexander's body give, being given to a general named Aridaeus. And nobody knows where this Aridaeus came from or who he was. And most scholars have written this as being a separate Aridaeus. Whereas I argue, and again, this is my own published research, that maybe this was perhaps actually Philip Aridaeus, because it would have made sense to give the new king Alexander's body to help with legitimacy and to help stabilize things. And in terms of nicknames, um, you have in the ancient scholarly sources, scholars um, and the ancient scholars just giving people nicknames if they had the same name. So you have, for example, Clytus the Black and Clytus the White, but there is no distinguishing feature between the two Aridaeuses. So I personally feel that they are the same Aridaeus, and this is scholars writing him off because they think he has some, some kind of intellectual disability, so they are seeing him as less important. So I'm finally ending here on prosthetics. We do have evidence of prosthetics in ancient Egypt. Uh, this is from the Durham Mu Oriental Museum, which is in the UK. This is a woman who was a priestess who was buried with an arm prosthetic. They think she was born without her arm. And what they did when they mummified her was they made her a prosthetic arm. And this kind of shows perhaps the kind of the shifting view towards disability in ancient Egypt under the Greeks, but we're not 100% sure. Um, because if you remember the, back to the earlier mummies of Gehazit and Sipta, their bodies were not modeled 
a five billion bombers, whereas hers was. But it also could have been her personal choice to have her body be complete in the afterlife. We don't know because unfortunately her name and other information about her doesn't survive. And when people embalmed her or the Egyptologists who found her discovered her, they originally thought she was a man until they actually looked at the body. So she was misgendered and misidentified until they looked at her further. We also have examples of toe prosthetics that date from the Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom in ancient Egypt. So again, the same time period, roughly as Tutankhamun and slightly earlier than that that we know were used in life. And we also have researchers who use them and tested out these kind of prosthetics with modern patients. So they made replicas and they actually found that they were more comfortable than our modern prosthetics. So the ancient Egyptians kind of had this figured out. This is from an older woman um, who was in her fifties when she died. This prosthetic is made out of wood with leather straps. This is a less exam um, expensive example, which is made out of cardinage, which is basically paper mache, which is in the British Museum. So in conclusion, as I have hope I have demonstrated in the ancient world, disabled people lived and thrived. Uh, they seem to have been represented without stigma in art and were incorpor incorporated into society to the best of their ability. Um, when disability, however, is discussed in scholarship, it often contains ableist and disabled biases. And as I've also tried to show, museums have this material in their collections, and they can be used to create disability-centered programming, and it's often on display. It's just a question of identifying it, and nobody really has until now, uh, because disability narratives and their societal implications have long been overlooked. I also hoped I demonstrated that Herpocrates is representative of how disabled people were portrayed mythologically, and kind of that fusion of Greek and Egyptian culture. Uh, Philip III Aridaeus is also representative of this fusion and kind of the continuation of policies of Alexander the Great towards disabled people. And I hope that this finally shows an example of why a disabled perspective was need needed in e Egyptology research. Thank you. And I just want to briefly mention this book that I'm co-editing, which is currently under peer review with Routledge, which is going to be the first ever book on disability in ancient Egypt which is called Disability in Ancient Egypt and Egyptology All Our Yesterdays. And these are all of our contributors that we have in this book. So this will be forthcoming, hopefully, the next year or so. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. That was really fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is a question. I have some questions, but there is a question in the chat. Let me get to yep. that. Um, Susan asked, are you going to uh, address the dwarf cemetery behind the Giza pyramid? Yes, I didn't have time for that. <laughs> but yes, there is a cemetery with people with dwarfism behind the Giza pyramid. Um, um, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to stop sharing so that way you can see me. Um, sorry. All right, I'll just leave it as it is for now. Um, where, yes, you had people with dwarfism who were being buried in the shadow of the pyramids because it was considered to be a great honor. So that again shows just how important they were within that society and just how not stigmatized disability was. They almost kind of had like a special status within the society at that point. And there also is also in the workman's village at Deir el Medina, a woman with dwarfism who was buried in that cemetery who died in childbirth. So it again shows she had a family who loved her and she was incorporated into that society as well. Okay. Um, a question I had, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about the bias of war disability versus um, disability at birth. Mm -hmm. So do you think that helped it? Like when, when um, like war disability, they started honoring them more? then they kind of took a step back and said we should honor everyone? I I think it's an interesting dichotomy between the two. I mean, I feel like the ancient Egyptians at least viewed disability just being as a natural port, part of life. And I think, honestly, that it's the more modern historians who are bringing kind of their own cultural biases and our perceptions of disability to this material rather than the material being 
saying that there were differences in and of themselves, if that makes sense. No, yeah, I get that. Um, yes. uh, Susan wants to ask a question. Let me yes. just, you can just unmute. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hi, how are you? So about 30 years ago, uh, my husband and I were going to e Egypt and we took a course at the new school in Egyptian culture, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we were um, tasks, tasked with doing some research. And one of the choices was dwarfism in Egypt. And my, mm -hmm. my brother isn't a contraplasic dwarf. So I said, well, that's very interesting. And we had this wonderful experience of going to the Brooklyn Museum Library and being treated like royalty. Mm. <laughs> it was just fabulous. But anyway, we we really did a lot of, uh, we spent a lot of time because it was just fun. And one of the things that, this is 30 years ago, so perhaps it's uh, been discounted now, but it was in, in part, my question about the dwarf cemetery behind Giza has to do with this, that dwarves were really revered. And there was an early Pharaoh uh, who heard about small people and he, I'm sure uh, Alexander, you probably know this because it's so such a famous story in Egypt, but he sent um, a boat uh, to the Sudan, I believe, to bring back mm -hmm. the midget or the small. And he and then he wrote something that said, please make sure that if the boat sinks, you save him first. Um, but anyway, so my my take from doing all of this research um, was that dwarves were really revered and Seneb is certainly one example, but there were many others. And I was wondering your your take on disability, at least in listening to you, sounded like more that it was a depiction of a normal condition. But I was wondering whether, in fact, um, all disabilities were revered because they were special. And I, I don't know. This is a long time ago. The other thing that was interesting to me in the research as I went a little further and we got into uh, Greek mythology and the Greek culture and then from there is that all of a sudden uh, dwarfs, because that was our focus, um, were basically excluded and they were uh, degraded and they weren't worth anything and, you know, get rid of them. So um, that just always fascinated me and I was just wondering what your thought was about that. Okay, that, that's very interesting to hear and glad that someone else has kind of done this research too. I would say that within ancient Egypt, yes, at least during the Old Kingdom, there seems to have been a special reverence around people with dwarfism. However, I would say disability in general in Egypt seems to have been more you accepted it because it was part of the natural variation that was part of the human condition, I would argue. And because the Egyptian concepts were ma and set, so you had order and chaos, and you didn't want to do anything to upset that. So if you're trying to get rid of your disabled population, you were potentially upsetting that balance, and that wouldn't be good. Um, in Greece, however, that's interesting that there you were finding examples of um, people being stigmatized and things. I would say that the thinking around the stigmatization of disabled people in ancient Greece is now starting to change. And this is mainly with the research of Dr. Debbie Sneed, who has put out a couple of articles recently within like the past three to five years. Um, one was on um, putting ramps on temples in ancient Greece, which kind of showed that they were making societal accommodations for disabled people, particularly when it came to healing temples. And there is a newest one that was out is on infanticide in ancient Greece. And she argues essentially that there is more examples of active societal interventions towards keeping disabled infants alive than there is examples that we have of them deliberately killing disabled infants. And it, that whole thing is very kind of icky too, because it again assumes that disability is a binary and you like you can tell at birth that an infant is disabled. 
And that's not always the case. Like with me, with the cerebral palsy, you don't necessarily know that until the child's several months old or older. And with other disabilities like autism, it's the same thing. But I, I do know back 30 years ago, um, it was Robert Garland who was writing on disability. And he had kind of, he was bringing kind of that societal bias to that I was sharing with you to his study of disability. So I'm wondering if that's what was going on in the information that you were getting at the time or if society did start to change. I will say arguably that the society did kind of start to change at least from what I know and what other scholars have thus concluded during the Roman period. So maybe that's what you were getting as well. And I, as for why it started to change during that time period, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that during that period at this point. I just, I was just interested that dwarfs were revered. Yeah. It just seems to me from all the iconography you just showed that it looks as though other disabled people maybe were too. Yeah. They were, they were, they were messengers from what, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I agree with you to a certain extent, but I mean, it's also in that extent how much of that is our putting on disability is being seen as different today back onto that society when maybe they weren't necessarily seeing it as a difference. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. they, as you said, they were seeing it as people being special instead. Yeah, well, thank you. That's very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Nancy Kay um, has a question also. So um, thank you, first of all, for this interesting lecture. I kind of assumed that these disabilities were modern and they didn't occur in the ancient times, but obviously they did. Um, but my question is like, as far as you know, how does this measure up to the depiction of disabled persons in Western art, you know, from the 1300s onward? Is it, you know, a lot more or, or we don't really know? Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm an ancient historian. I don't necessarily know later time periods with art. I will say that other scholars have researched on this. And from what I do know, because I do run the UK Disability History and Heritage Hub, there are scholars who have written on depictions of disabled people starting in the medieval time period so there it definitely was still continuing but whether or not they were as incorporated into the society from that point onwards i don't know and I'm, I'm going leaning towards things started to change after the roman period to them possibly being more stigmatized and separated out from society thanks yeah and I had one more question, and then, then we'll let you go to bed. <laughs> um, what You said that you always wanted to be an Egyptologist. How did that happen in South Salem, New York? <laughs> All right. Since this is great because it's a library, um, it happened because of a book. Mm -hmm. My parents, when I was little, and we don't really honestly know how this happened or whatever, got me a series of first discovery books that was basically a whole bunch of books on different topics. And I was, for whatever reason, and we still don't know why, absolutely fascinated by the one on pyramids. <laughs> like, to the point where I'm like, I want you to read this to me every single night. This was great. And I was really fascinated, and this was kind of interesting given what I ended up studying by one particular page on it that had Howard Carter discovering Tutankhamun's tomb. And my name for him used to be Mr. No Talking Man. I don't know why. <laughs> you don't know why? You just, that no. was just what you called him. <laughs> that was just, I was like two years um, old. And, yeah. but that's two where it started. You were fascinated by it. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well. Okay, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I think it's time for us to let you go. Um, this is great. Um, and if you want to come back, like after your book is out and, and you know, do another talk, we'd be happy to have you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your very thoughtful questions and for your attention tonight.